Kim, what's on your radar? Well, another round of Pfizer documents have dropped. This is part of the 340,000 some odd pages the FDA and Pfizer wanted to release over the course of several decades. But instead, the group requesting the documents sued and a judge ordered the FDA to make them available by the end of this year. Well, each round of documents is to be delivered on the first of each month. So this past April 1st, no joke, over 11,000 pages were released. Between these documents and another document released on March 24th to the group, a group called Public Health and Medical Professionals for Transparency, we've learned some bombshells. The first bombshell in the document is that natural immunity works and Pfizer knows it. The clinical trial data showed those with previous infection of COVID had no difference in outcome than those vaccinated. In the limited trial, none of the vaccinated nor those with previous infection resulted in severe di disease defined by either the FDA or the CDC. They were broken up into two different groups. The FDA and the CDC define severe COVID slightly differently. The CDC rough roughly defines it as anyone needing hospitalization, whereas the FDA defines it as anyone needing supplemental oxygen. Either way, there were zero cases of severe COVID in the natural immunity group, whether they were vaccinated or not. And their own data also showed that natural immunity was statistically identical to the vaccine against infection. That's what their data showed. Yet rather than say people with natural immunity don't seem to need the vaccine, which is what they've been saying in Europe, for example, Pfizer instead spun their conclusion and said, quote, final efficacy results show that the vaccine provided protection against COVID-19 and participants with or without evidence of prior infection with SARS-CoV-2. Another revelation from the documents was that adverse reactions were more frequent and more severe in younger groups. The document reads, quote, reactogenicity and adverse events were generally milder and less frequent in participants in the older group compared with younger group and overall tended to increase with increasing vaccine dose. Older is defined as 55 and older and the study itself was for 16 and above. So the side effects were more frequent and more severe in people under 55, even though we know the younger you are, the less likely you're to experience severe COVID. According to The Lancet, 16-year-olds have a 99.993% chance of surviving COVID. A 30-year-old is at 99.943%. At 50, their survivability is 99.572%. Only once you hit 60 does it drop below 99%. A document procured during the dump was a consent form for a children's clinical trial of the Pfizer vaccine. The form is from December 15th, 2021, so only 15 weeks ago. And it interestingly states some facts that have been labeled by the mainstream media as being misinformation. The consent form lists several possible side effects, including myocarditis, which many of us know about. But the document says the rate of occurrence is 10 in 100,000 people and they don't specify age or gender. So that's much higher than previously reported rates of one in 50,000 people. Even then, we know the bulk of those cases are in younger males. So when controlling for age and gender, the risk significantly increases. The consent form also states, quote, the effects of the COVID-19 vaccine on sperm, a pregnancy, a fetus, or a nursing child are not known. And this is something that has caused a lot of younger women and parents of teen girls hesitation, which they were demonized over, and people have worried that there could be long-term side effects of affecting fertility. And despite these scientists admitting in this consent form that they simply do not know, it has been espoused as fact that the vaccines don't have any adverse effects on reproduction whatsoever. But the fact is, we simply don't know. Another, data con another idea condemned as a conspiracy theory is what's called an ADE response, antibody-dependent reaction. This is when a vaccine ends up triggering a worse illness than what the person would normally experience. And doctors like Robert Malone, who have been sounding the alarm of this as a possible reaction to mRNA vaccines, have been demonized and smeared, yet the consent form clearly states, quote, although not seen to date, it cannot yet be ruled out that the study vaccine could make a later COVID-19 illness more severe. So if it were really not even something to be concerned about, the form wouldn't even bring it up. Yet here it is saying they can't rule it out yet. One other interesting admission from the document dump is this statement, quote, clinical laboratory evaluations showed a transient decrease in lymphocytes that was observed in all age and dose groups after dose one, which resolved within approximately one week. So in plain English, this means 
white blood cell counts dropped in that one week after the first dose of the vaccine. So this is leaving a person with a weakened immune system for a week after getting the first dose of the vaccine. So there's a lot of things that we could speculate from this, like is this why we saw sudden spikes in cases in countries that began mass vaccination campaigns you know, with people weakened immune systems, were they all catching the virus a lot uh, more vulnerable to catching the virus suddenly for that little period of time? Also, uh, since people weren't even considered partially vaccinated until a week or so after getting the dose, did this skew the infection rate? If you got a bunch of immunocompromised people uh, for that week running around and then catching the virus and then they're considered unvaccinated, is that fair? These are questions that that kind of leads us towards. But in the least, it seems like this would be good information for people to know about. Wouldn't you want to know that your immune system is perhaps compromised for a week? You'd maybe be more careful. We're at least learning about it now, even though we didn't know about it before. But now we're learning about it because of the data the FDA and Pfizer didn't want released. We're finally seeing it. So interesting stuff coming out in this in these document dumps. Um, and, and, you know, and I think obviously at this point, a lot of this is just hindsight, right? There's, well, although there are still a lot of implications, there's a lot of places still doing mandates. Um, a lot of the colleges are still doing mandates a lot. And now we see from these documents that from the, the trial, Pfizer even said there's more adverse reactions and they're more severe. The younger you are in, the more you dose. And we just don't have long-term data yet. And they admit that in these documents yet. I think there's, I don't know if it was, you know, I feel like when I go back and look at all the statements that Pfizer made, I don't feel like they said much different than actually what's in these papers. It's just that they didn't they didn't correct when, let's say, Fauci or other or FDA spokespeople or, you know, uh, M Rochelle Walensky or when they kind of said things that were maybe a bit counter to this, they didn't come out and say that's actually not accurate. You know, like so I'm not sure if it you know, what, like where the blame then goes. And also I think we need to look forward and say, maybe we should be reevaluating a lot of the decisions, especially when it comes to younger people. The farm, yeah, pharmaceutical industry is, is not used to transparency. Like it's not their, it's not their preferred approach. And right. I, you know, I, and I think particularly in a pandemic uh, where public health becomes almost as important as the way that you're specifically treating it, because you, you need the public to be in, invested in and to trust what they're being told by public health officials and by everybody involved, transparency becomes that much more important. So they really shouldn't be, I, I really wish they had not fought this. And you know, the, more, the more pressure on them to release all of the evidence of mm -hmm. efficacy, all of the evidence of side effects, everything, just, you know, just get it out there and let people, let peop, let's, let people study it. And given that, you know, a combination of things that, A, you can certainly still uh, contract the virus and spread it if you're vaccinated, it, maybe you're less likely to do so, but <laughs> vaccination is not standing in the way of, or, or is any other mitigation effort standing in the way of a wave coming through and everybody getting it, because we've seen that happen uh, at least twice now. So given that, and given that the, that the severity for younger people of the disease, it's not it's not that bad. That there's low, uh, very low death rate among uh, young children, um, uh, among the under 18, he otherwise healthy people uh, 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 in the younger age categories, also not uh, not in in that much trouble. Given given those realities, I don't see how you can justify the the requirement for vaccination in many of the, the settings where they're most likely to be required, schools, university campuses, as you mentioned, it just, it seems, it, it seems, and given then also, you know, what you're raising about side effects and that even if it's, even if they're mild side effects, even if you're, you know, kind of sick for a day or something and then that's it, that still might end up being, right. for this age category, that might end up being worse than the disease, or maybe it's not, but why shouldn't it be your choice or you know, something you talk to a doctor about? It has to be required. That seems so, it seems so hard to justify that for, yeah. for the groups of people most likely to have the mandates in place. You know, yes, beyond, beyond 50, if you have an underlying health condition, absolutely, I, I think the calculus totally shifts, but, uh, but that's different when we're right. talking about the people most likely to have vaccine mandates. Yeah, I mean, the older people, we know the older you get, the more severe COVID is for you. In fact, if you're 100 years old, so I was looking at the chart 
of survivability. And if you're 100 years old, you're still, believe it or not, more likely to survive COVID, but not by much. It's 57% survivability right. once you hit 100. But it starts to drop below 99 at 60. Well, these people are retired, you know, in this age group from 60 to 100. You're looking at the vast majority of them not even being working. So you're right. They're not even subject to mandates. But what these, what these, uh, what this late, latest data dump really showed us, especially with them admitting they don't know the long-term side effects with fertility or sperm or anything like that. They don't know the long-term. They even said in the previous document dump from March, uh, there was a document that showed they don't know the long-term side effects of even myocarditis once it subsides. So they said, yeah, most of the cases, you know, the patient subsided, the symptoms were uh, gone, but we don't know long-term what that means. They, they, they state that. So to have younger people and then and then these documents to say yeah the younger you know younger people and the more doses it seems that they have more adverse events why would we then have young people mandated to do this yeah. uh it just doesn't make sense when you go through all these documents and i think this proves that and i think for a lot of those parents that have been fighting mandates i think this document dump will be very consequential to them in that battle i think in the legal battle moving forward so i think that's where these documents come in handy is is in the also you know their admittance to certain side effects like myocarditis we know that now my big question is are they paying the legal the medical bills for these patients who ended up with myocarditis or is that just sorry that's your risk you you took it you right. knew that there was that risk did you i don't know so uh why are they not then forking over the cash for those those medical bills i'm not certain if they are or they aren't but i tend to think they're not because I know that they were released from any sort of liability, but um, so th I think that's what these documents are going to are going to mean moving forward is maybe they will be used in the anti-mandate uh, legal defense and parents uh, trying to prevent their children from being vaccinated, yeah. possibly. All right, well, thank you, Kim. We'll have more rising right after this.